Okay, now I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Vincent Belvoir, who will give his presidential address. Thank you, and good morning. Good morning. You do it the whole time. <laughs> so, this morning there are three areas I'd like to address with you today. The first relates to the serious challenges that PPA members face over the next few years. These are not just any challenges, but unique, severe, and threatening to our future. Second, I will list the steps we need to take to counteract these threats. In short, what we can do to fight back. Third, I will address what each one of you individually can do to help secure our future. This is a fight that can be won, but not if we look to others to fight for us. No, in order to secure our future, we need the active engagement of our grassroots. We need to create momentum that will propel PPA through these difficult times. And so let's begin with those threatening challenges looming before us. There are three of them. The first is health care reform and its many tentacles, such as Medicare reimbursement, electronic health records, CPT billing codes, DSM-5 and ICD-10, and of course, at the crux of health care uh, at the crux of health care reform, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, or commonly referred to as Obamacare. While many are overwhelmed by these changes, it is in, it is in our best interest to understand them so that we can best serve our clients and also make a decent living. For the second year in a row at APA State Leadership Conference, health care reform was the central theme. It is clear that the changes coming our way will be immense and turbulent. At APA, some relied on metaphors to convey what's in store for us. There was the freight train barreling down on us. APA Executive Director Catherine Nordle called it a marathon, one in which we have no universal roadmap to guide us. And others went so far as to call healthcare reform a tsunami of change coming our way. So what does healthcare reform have in store for us? Well, there are two certainties. Hope and change. The Affordable Care Act will extend coverage to many more people, and that coverage requires mental health services not only be available, but thanks to the federal parity law, that mental health coverage be on par with primary care services. These days, there are more questions than answers. For example, will Governor Corbett sign on to the uh, Medicaid expansion? How will service delivery change in the future? To what extent will, will insurers bring back capitation? Will lesser trained and cheaper counselors reduce the public's demand for psychologists? Will the fee-for-service model be less available? Now, some say the reason we, we pay so much more for health care than any other industrial nation without better results is because the incentive structure in our system is, is wrong. Providers are paid primarily for procedures and tests, not on outcomes. Healthcare overhaul tends to flip this fee-for-services system to one where insurers or the government pays providers to keep patients healthy. The goal is to have providers reimbursed more for the value of their services than the volume. For psychologists, this approach raises the difficult question of how to quantify value in a field where outcomes are extremely difficult to measure. Psychologists need more information to help them make decisions about how they will practice in the future. Until now, most of us have felt uh, that dealing with insurers is a little, little like uh, the following video. Checkmate. 
Insurance company rolls. What's that? <laughs> Americans are taking notice. There's two ways to go through life. You can play by the rules. <laughs> or you can follow insurance company rules. I call insurance company rules. <laughs> or you can do whatever the hell you want. Let it change your tennis game. I love insurance rules. <laughs> insurance companies rewrite the rules as they go along to win every time. Why shouldn't you? I got throwing stars. Insurance company rules are a fun alternative to the social contract. Throwing stars? You don't know insurance company rules? No. Oh, they're so sweet. I get to change the rules whenever I want, however I want. Oh, I know. So we were playing tennis, and now you're using ninja weapons. This isn't a ninja weapon. Oh, I call staple guns. <laughs> Some might object. They'll change the way you play poker. Four aces. I got nunchucks. Insurance company rules. Why fight fair when you can use nunchucks? Insurance rules not valid in pretty much every other industrialized country. Not recommended for the sick, the about to be sick, or anyone who will ever get any older than they are right now. Insurance company rules not compatible with healthcare for America now. Which side are you on? So if you notice, the video ended with a website link called, Which Side Are You On? It seems to me, though, that presenting the issue as one side or the other isn't really helping us get to a solution, rather just polarizes us. <coughs> if we expect to not only understand health care reform, but also have a seat at the decision-making table, we must encourage frank dialogue between the provider and the payer. We must understand that the payer is not only the patient, but also the insurer, and sometimes even the employer. All of us have, all of them have a financial interest in containing health care costs. Again, getting a seat at the decision-making table is the key to our future. So, the first challenge is health, uh, is health care overall. The second challenge is a combination of challenges within the state of PA and just described by Sam in an article, well, also in an article entitled The Perfect Storm. Some of these uh, challenges are the following. Rate reductions by some commercial insurers, increased fraud and abuse initiatives by medical assistants, the mounting pressure from insurers to provide, to prove our worth through outcome measures, the initiatives related to pay for performance, and there's more. How about the problems that students face <clears throat> in obtaining internships and postdoc positions? What about the spiraling cost of education and the debt that burdens early career psychologists? There is the attempt to change the Child Protective Services Law arising from the Penn State scandal, the exclusion of psychologists from hospital practice, and the severe budget cuts threatening school psychology positions. Now, with such substantial turbulence before us, one can understand why Sam speaks of a perfect storm. I'd like you to imagine for a minute that PPA is a ship amidst the storm. The challenges that we face act like massive waves threatening the integrity of our ship, our PPA. With these waves of change coming our way, you would think we have our hands full. But I did mention three challenges. When there is a storm at sea, the ship needs a good captain and crew to get her to safety. Without a seasoned captain and crew, that ship could be in trouble. Well, after serving our association for 26 years, Tom DeWall is retiring. 26 years is a long time. In fact, it's so long that this is how Tom looked. <laughs> Even that was <laughs> the Regardless of how Tom came in, regardless of how Tom came in, he is ready to leave. 
He's been a pretty darn good shipper, uh, skipper of our ship. <laughs> and along with his first mate, <laughs> they run a pretty good ship. If Tom's retiring isn't enough of a shock, well, maybe this will get your attention. 18 months after Tom retires, Sam Knapp will also retire. <laughs> Now add to that, add to that the likely retirement of, of some other PPA crew. We're getting up there. And we have some serious challenges for our PPA ship, especially as the waves of healthcare reform and many other challenges threaten the integrity of our ship. And so perhaps the perfect storm metaphor fits. If so, our ship needs to gain momentum to propel itself through the waves of change. The good news is that our, ship, our ship's momentum comes from its members, comes from you. With the right momentum, we can ride through any storm. So here's how we're going to do it. There are four action steps that will propel our PPA ship through the stormy seas. The first is to address our leadership transition, and we have been doing this for the last year. When Dr. Palmer asked me to chair the Secession Development Task Force, the first thing I did was contact four other state psych associations who recently went through similar leadership transitions. I figured, why recreate the wheel? Learn from them and do it better. And indeed we have. I'd like to thank those who have served on the task force, Drs. Judy Blau, Rex Gatto, Mark Hope, Linda Knaus, Bruce Mapes, Don McAleer, David Pometer, Jeff Pincus, Diane Salter, and Emily Stevick. One year ago, we engaged in a national search and received over 120 resumes. We ranked the top 25 candidates and from that group, we conducted 11 video conference interviews. We distilled the top five candidates, gave them a battery of executive assessments, and then brought them into Harrisburg to meet PPA staff and interview with our search team. So from this comprehensive search, we have found PPA's next captain. It is with great pride that I introduce to you Ms. Krista Padanostro. I've asked Krista to come up and say a few words, but first let me tell you a little about her. A graduate of Penn State University in 1992, she brings over 20 years of nonprofit organization management to DPA. She has progressed steadily up the association leadership ladder, including positions as COO, of the Pittsburgh Technology Council, CEO of the Military Operations Research Society, and COO of the Logistics Officer Association. Her resume and references speak to her ability to connect with all generations of membership, from those in her 20s to those in retirement. She has displayed excellent leadership skills in steering associations through changing and challenging times. Now, while today is indeed the longest day of the year, and I could spend a lot more time talking about her accomplishments, how about if you meet her directly? So I introduce to you. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, first of all, thank you, Vince, for that very kind introduction. I think my parents would have been quite proud. Um, speaking of my parents, my dad was a school superintendent for over 30 years. And as he progressed, as I was progressing through my early career, he gave me lots of sage advice about uh, being a good person, but also professionally 
Um, I'll never forget the day you said to me when I was talking about having to speak in front of groups. If you speak from your heart, you can never go wrong. So I had actually prepared remarks today to share with you, but I decided after having a chance to meet some of you and talk with a lot of you in this room over the last three days, I would just forgo those remarks and try to speak from my heart. So I just wanted to say thank you all uh, for such a warm welcome. Um, for those of you I haven't had a chance to meet yet, I definitely look forward to that opportunity to hearing your thoughts and ideas about the future of PPA. You're an important part of the team, and I want to make sure that we have uh, a good rapport and we can talk about how we're going to steer this ship in the future. Um, certainly, I'm thrilled by the opportunity to be the next executive director, understanding the huge shoes that I have to fill. I actually wrote that on Tom's uh, retirement card, so I certainly understand that. And after hearing him speak this morning, I know that those shoes are growing. Um, it's such a wonderful tenure that you've Along with my nose. <laughs> <laughs> but I just wanted to take just one moment to share with you three goals that I have for the organization moving forward um, and understanding there's still a lot to learn. Uh, the first goal is to actually leverage our current organizational strengths to build a, a, a solid um, and strategic organizational plan for the future. We're actually kicking off a strategic session this afternoon. I look forward to seeing where our collective minds can lead us in the future. Secondly, we want to enhance the organization's effectiveness by creating a technology infrastructure that increases opportunities for collaboration and communication amongst our members and our stakeholders and our organizational leaders. I think that's really going to be a critical goal for us moving forward. And finally, we want to continue to offer relevant and vibrant, valuable membership programs and services that, that keep pace with the changing professional environment. So I look forward to having you all help us achieve those goals. Uh, before I close, I already mentioned Tom. I wanted to offer my congratulations to you and salute you for your years of dedicated service uh, to PPA. I'm also very fortunate that Tom has built a wonderful staff team that I have a chance to grow with and learn from in the future. Um, I made two mental notes as you were speaking though this morning that you know, obviously just come off the top of my head. The first was, don't mess this up. That's a note to myself. So. <laughs> and the second, and this is a real one, um, I want to talk to you about the 2014 budget. You need to make sure there's a building maintenance line. Sinkholes, bugs, power tools, not my thing. So, yeah. Congratulations. So we have the next captain of our ship. You may ask, well, what about Tom? Well, rumor has it that his first mate has plans for the outgoing captain. <laughs> and then, of course, Tom has talked about his retirement dreams. But PPA's ship, or PPA, PPA's board has other plans. Come September, Tom will hand the keys over to Krista walk about two blocks south to the Capitol building and begin his new role as PPA's government relations consultant. Who better than Tom than advocate to PPA or advocate for PPA to our legislators? In addition to this role, Tom has graciously agreed to remain readily available to Krista as consultant, just a phone call away. Now, succession development doesn't stop here. As PPA president, I will facilitate the successful transition of our new executive director and the positive working relationship between the captain and crew. After all, we can't propel our ship forward if the captain and crew are not in sync. Granted, it'll be different than the way it used to be. But as noted, change is coming, and we need to be ready. In addition, in about six months, a new secession development task force will begin to address the retirement of Sam Knapp. I've asked President-elect Bruce Mapes to assist me as co-chair of that new task force. Finding the next Sam brings unique challenges. After all, there is only one Sam. Nevertheless, the terrific, uh, given the terrific job that the current task force performed 
and given the wealth of experience and talent that Krista brings, I have full confidence that we will be successful. So as the session development evolves, we turn to action step two. Every ship, especially in stormy seas, needs a good compass. Our compass is the strategic plan, last revised in March 2008. It's now time to recalibrate our compass. The plan, which is on our website for you to read, describes PK's vision and mission, and then lists specific, specific strategies we use to get there. Now, vision, the first part of the plan, is like standing on a mountaintop, looking out in the distance, pointing to a spot far away and saying, we want to go there. Our vision states, PK is a member-driven organization dedicated to promoting and advancing psychology in Pennsylvania, advocating for public access to psychological services, and enhancing multiple dimensions of human welfare, while supporting the development of competent and ethical psychologists. Our mission, along with strategic actions, is the description of how we're going to get there specifically. Our mission states to educate, update, and inform the public and our membership on cutting-edge psychological theory and practice through training activities and public policy initiatives. Because our strategic plan is the compass that guides our ship, every PPA member should know who's involved with calibrating it. The board of directors and the chairs of every committee will represent you this winter in rewriting the plan. Say hello to them. Thank them for their service. And let them know what you think are the most important things that PPA should be doing in the future. Now, I was thinking about putting all the pictures up here, but we have too many. So I'm going to ask um, board chairs that are here today, committee chairs that are here today, to just stand for a moment. Thank you. We have plenty more. I, I, I do look forward very much so to recalibrating our compass with you. Okay, so the first two action steps, finding a new captain and recalibrating our compass, address the internal challenges to PPA. The third step involves fighting back fighting against those external threats to psychology. Now, while there are many threats, none has been more insidious, more destructive to the morale of psychologists than the long, slow, painful decline in third-party reimbursements. Rate reductions come in two ways. One is the outright slashing of rates, as we have recently experienced by some payers. The other is the refusal to increase rates, at least commensurate with the rate of inflation. Both method, methods have served to erode our industry. Let me stop right here and caution you that we, we cannot talk directly about taking action to influence rates. That would be a violation of antitrust law with regard to every commercial insurer, but not Medicare. We could talk all day long about taking unified action against declining Medicare rates. You see, APA has studied the formula for Medicare uh, to determine rates for the various uh, healthcare professions. This complex formula is called the resource-based relative value scale. Psychologists have experienced a 39% reduction in rates over the last 10 years when inflation is considered. 39%. APA believes this dramatic reduction is due to the unfair application of this RVS formula to psychological services. While most healthcare practitioners have experienced Medicare rate cuts, the RVS formula creates disproportionately more severe rate decreases for psychologists compared to other healthcare professionals. Let me say it again. So the RVS formula creates disproportionately more severe rate decreases for
for us compared to other healthcare professionals. Now we're willing to do our fair share, but we're not willing to take on substantially more financial burden than other healthcare professionals. APA wants psychologists throughout our nation to fight back against these unfair cuts. Next month, APA will mobilize a campaign for legislation that will order Medicaid and Medicare to change the RVS formula for reimbursing psychologists to one that will more appropriately reflect the value of services we provide. PPA will join this fight. PPA will be the state with the most vocal advocates. We will create momentum that will carry Pennsylvania and inspire other states. Now, such momentum will require a tremendous grassroots effort. And not just from those few hundred of you PPA members who routinely respond to legislative alerts. When that call comes, PPA psychologists need to create a lot of noise, a lot of momentum. Now, Medicare isn't the only area where we can fight back, though it is the most significant. In recent years, private insurance companies have modeled their rates after Medicare. If Medicare can cut rates, other insurers will justify them doing the same. And indeed, they have. And by the way, those of you in academia, you should care too. If, rate cuts continue, uh, if rates continue to be cut, or not adjusted upward for inflation, you'll see fewer applicants for grad school because ours will quickly become a profession that a young person in debt cannot afford. In, in addition to fighting back against Medicare, we can fight back against commercial insurance rates using the teeth <coughs> of mental health parity. The federal law, the federal parity law is a complex one, basically stating that mental health treatment must be on par with medical health treatment. In studying this issue, APA believes it has found some narrow ground within the parity law indicating that insurance companies may be violating parity in how mental health services are paid. With APA's guidance and PPA's, with APA's guidance and legal expertise, PPA will explore these possible violations of parity on two fronts. First, some CPT codes are defined according to the, to the time the provider spends with the patient. The three codes now used for outpatient individual therapy serve as an example. Now, similar codes exist on the medical side. The argument is this. If an insurer pays the medical provider a rate differential for varying lengths of treatment, they should do so equally for the mental health provider. Medicare, along with a few insurance companies, pay a rate differential for these codes. However, most do not. With APA by our side, PPA is now addressing this serious concern with insurers. The second area of potential parity violations is the manner with which rate schedules are set. On the medical side versus on the mental health side. Again, this is an issue of fairness of parity. It's not an issue of money. Rather, it's an issue of confronting and stopping the discrimination toward mental health patients. When insurers allow for reimbursement rate increases on the medical side, but not on the mental health side, we believe this may constitute a parity violation. Now, I should caution you, this is a relatively new area of exploration with a small window of opportunity. Nevertheless, we hope great things will come of it. Starting immediately, I will make it a priority that PPA aggressively pursues these potential parity violations, as well as advocating for federal legislation regarding the changes in Medicare rates. We're not going to take this, these threats to our livelihood sitting down. We're going to fight back. To fight back effectively, we need momentum. And that brings me to the fourth step, an action that's absolutely necessary to propel the PPA ship forward. We must create our own force of change. And as I describe the fourth action step, I ask you this. Where are you going to be as the waves of the perfect storm hit? Will you be out there alone on your board? 
trying to navigate the waves on your own? Or will you join us on the PPA ship? <laughs> this is our ship, our PPA. True, sometimes we are at the party boat, like Wednesday night's evening celebration with Tom, last night's poker game, right Mark? Tonight's ECP reception and the dance, and by the way, we have a great band. But at other, other times, we are the working ship, especially when the weather is rough. Now, there are some pretty big waves forming around us, and we need momentum to push us through the rough seas ahead. Our ship goes nowhere without momentum, without movement, without motivation. This momentum is created through the passion and commitment of our members. There are many issues out there, many ways to overcome. The power of PPA is in your active involvement in advocacy. You 300 volunteers give us that power. In truth, the most realistic image of our PPA ship is this one. You see, PPA ship, our ship, is propelled by hundreds of oars, each being pulled by the individual efforts of people like you. I'll be blunt, we need more people pulling on oars for this to work. Yeah, we have uh, committees who actively work to bring on, on board new and varied members. The multicultural committee, early career psychologists, leadership development, membership, nominations and elections. All these committees serve to bring members on board and find the right board for them to pull. We know they do a fantastic job because every year we hear the envy of other states who marvel at what our volunteers can do. We bring, we bring passion, commitment, energy, and creativity. But we can do better. We need to do better. We're in a race of our lives right now. The winds have changed and the threatening waves are serious indeed. We need all hands on deck. We need everybody to pull. We need to create momentum unlike ever before movement that will drive the PPA ship right through the storm. Now, some say momentum is a difficult thing. Difficult to quantify, difficult to build. Maybe it's because as psychologists, we tend to overthink things like building momentum. But you know, it really is simple, as I'm going to show you in the following video. leadership and how to make a movement. So let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons from it. First, of course you know, a leader needs the guts to stand out and be ridiculed. <laughs> but what he's doing is so easy to follow. So here's his first follower with a crucial role. He's going to show everyone else how to follow. Now notice that the leader embraces him as an equal. So now it's not about the leader anymore, it's about them, plural. Now there he is calling to his friends. Now, if you notice that the first follower is actually an underestimated form of leadership in itself. It takes guts to stand out like that. The first follower is what transforms a lone nut into a leader. <laughs> and here comes a second follower. Now it's not a lone nut, it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd and the crowd is news. So a movement must be public. It's important to show not just the leader, but the followers, because you find that new followers emulate the followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, and immediately after, three more people. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point. Now we've got a movement. <laughs> so, notice that as more people join in, it's less risky. So those that were sitting on the fence before now have no reason not to. They won't stand out. They won't be ridiculed but they will be part of the in-crowd if they hurry. So, <laughs> over the next minute, you'll see all of the, uh, those that prefer to stick with the crowd, because eventually they would be ridiculed for not joining in. And that's how you make a movement. But, let's recap some lessons from this. 
So, first, if you are the type, like the shirtless dancing guy, that is standing alone, remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals. So it's clearly about the movement, not you. <laughs> okay, but we might have missed the real lesson here. The biggest lesson, if you noticed, did you catch it? Is that leadership is over-glorified. That yes, it was the shirtless guy who was first, and he'll get all the credit, but it was really the first follower that transformed the lone nut into a leader. So as we're told that we should all be leaders, that would be really ineffective. If you really care about starting a movement, have the courage to follow and show others how to follow. And when you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first one to stand up and join in. And what a perfect place to do that, Ted. Thanks. <laughs> Now, we will create momentum by asking all psychologists to join in this fight. <laughs> there are three ways each of us individually can add to the movement. First, find someone who is not a member and recruit them into PPA. Bring them on board the ship. Second, join a PPA committee and or find some PPA work to do. After all, PPA is not a cruise ship, but a working one. Become an active versus passive passenger. Pull an oar, even for a little while. Third, seek a significant role in the ship. We need committee chairs, board chairs, and officers who are inspired to make a change. Let's mentor each other into leadership roles. Remember, the biggest lesson we take from the last vi video is that leadership is indeed overglorified. If you really care about where the PPA ship moves, have the courage to follow and show others how to follow. And when you find that lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first one to stand up and join in. Come on board. Grab it more. I promise you, it'll be one heck of a ride. Thank you. <laughs>